can you all hear me? Yes, I hope you can. Um, I've started with this poem from Joe Bell, which in 2015 I came across in the Guardian newspaper as the poem for the week or the month selected by the poet laureate. Uh, and I thought, right, Doggerland has really made it into the public awareness um, by this sort of use of the word. And I also rather liked the, the bit that I've highlighted in green there, uh, the lemon and oa find bringing greetings from Doggerland. And in a way, it also epitomizes what I think that these two days of, of meeting and talks and chats have been, that uh, the, the material has been brought together and is, is being spread over a much wider audience than, than one might have imagined earlier on. The days, the two days I think of listening have been really interesting and valuable and very much food for thought. Uh, there have been various, as, as Jeff just said a, a few minutes ago, a continuum from wetland archaeology to the underwater surveys. Uh, the really is, uh, this came through with Star Car as well very much. Um, it is very much a continuum from one wetland environment to another one, to a wet environment. At this point also, I, I'd like to say thanks to Danielle, who's been helping out various of us um, and giving me trial practices and the like for a little while. It has been most helpful. It's next, please. Thank you. Um, I first got interested in the Dogger Bank uh, because back in the late 80s to mid 90s, uh, my husband John Coles was doing a lot of research on rock art in Sweden. And once I had got through the university's requirement that I mark exam papers, but it was just during the ideal time for field work, but never mind. Um, I was able to get the ferry to Sweden in order to take part in the rock art research. Now that's about a day and a half, or it used to be about a day and a half traveling on the ferry and plenty of time to think about things because you couldn't really go anywhere. And on the ferry, there was a map with a little sparkling light showing you where you were. And at one point, for quite a little while, we were over Dogger Bank. And knowing that Dogger Bank was not really very far below the ferry, really gave substance to, to my recognition, as it were, of that potential land in the past. Next, please. And that area, as I, I began to look into it a little bit more, I found had, had been known on for some while, and perhaps first came to the sort of the attention of the general public by the publication by Clement Reed in 1913 of a small book written basically for the general public, not for specialists, had a really rather nice map of the area in it. And this was something which again gave substance to the idea of it having been land. Um, and it also led to the production of various other maps. Next, please. Yeah, there we are. 
Um, some of you, many of you, I suspect, will recognize this as a part of Graham Clark's map published in 1936 in his book on the, uh, what we now call the early Mesolithic of this part of the world. The map itself is, is not bound into the book, but it's folded very carefully and put in a pocket in the back cover. And I suspect that very many people didn't actually find it uh, because it's, it's all very slight and thin. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, there were those who did. And again, the area was brought to, I wouldn't say public atten attention, um, but certainly to the archeological prehistorians. Next, please. Yeah, could, I, could you just go back there, Jeff? Is that possible? Yeah. Um, that's the area, the blank in the middle there, is the area that's been largely discussed, particularly yesterday, and which has sh the work has shown, the work that we have been hearing about for the last two days, how much can be achieved by the development of the techniques of research as, as well as choosing the aims. And, and it's the filling up of that area which has, has been so much brought to our attention in these papers. Next. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you can read that, it's quite small on my screen, uh, but I've put there one of the publications which really got me quite annoyed. Um, could I have the next slide? Yeah, I've highlighted there um, the things that I didn't really like very much. <laughs> uh, for all of the period in question, a land bridge connection existed. Now bridges to me are something quite narrow, but here they go on across the dry North Sea Plain, an important corridor, very narrow and probably straight, um, for the movement. In other words, let's get over this area and not over to the other side, and the movement of animals and of people. So everything there is, is conveying an idea that we've got to rush across here, it's probably quite dangerous, but we're on this bridge and we'll do our best and we'll get to the other side and we'll be all right. Uh, next, please. This, to me, is more what a land bridge, if there were any in that area, uh, might have looked like. Something that would get somebody over a local water course. And Many of you, I expect, will recognize what that is. Next, please. And there's the builder on the bottom left. Uh, yes, there would have been bridges all over Doggerland, bridges built by beavers over watercourses. And I know that I have a bee in my bonnet about beavers, but I do think that they would have provided the the means of travel for quite a lot of the land animals that occupied the area, including humans. Uh, is it possible to go back to the fourth slide, the Clark map? Thank you. And I've, I've wanted to go back to this map because it's the filling up of the map that, that I think is important and the filling up of our understanding of the character of that land, um, which is coming through from, from the work that we've been hearing about and the ab ability to cross check, to use different techniques and to see 
where results have, uh, are in agreement or maybe need modifying a bit um, or maybe developing a little more uh, is producing really good results and setting very high standards for the way in which research is being carried out and, and what is accepted and what still needs to be tested. And I think also that there are some things that could be added to the modeling. We've had some, some very interesting modeling on, on both days, perhaps some particularly yesterday, um, but as yet not very much, as far as I'm aware, not very much consideration of the impact of larger animals within that landscape. Uh, what, for example, impact did elk have? They browse, they affect trees, uh, they dive, uh, deep pond weeds at the bottom. Uh, as they emerge from their dive, they're dripping all over with pond weed and the like and redepositing it, it on the surface. There's a little bit of bioturbation going on there. Um, the same is true of beavers, perhaps rather more so because they excavate underground, underwater, as well as above on the dry land. Uh, they divert water courses. They bring mud up from the bottom and deposit it on the top of their lodges. And then of course, that's a little bit more moving around of, of the st stirring up the stratigraphy. Um, they have a major impact on forest, not destroying it, but simply diversifying it. Um, and they are of course known as ecosystem engineers, keystone species, which had, I would argue in the Mesolithic period, more impact on the landscape than humans had. I don't know that for sure, but it's a suggestion and, and maybe worth investigating to see whether uh, these other animals need to be considered when deciding what humans might have done and what the conditions might have been like. Uh, forward please to where we were about, yes. Right, that here, thank you, that's just right, and is a, a local, when I say local, I mean a small area of, of a pond in Brittany. You could actually, if you went to Scotland, you could probably take the same photograph now, um, or similar rather, that a small dam probably built by two adult beavers overnight maybe a little bit longer, is holding back water and there's a drop of about two meters. Now, in the course of, of the talks yesterday, somebody mentioned a perched um, peat layer, I think it was. Uh, you can begin to see how this, this raising of the water table in one layer, area um, might well be present within the area of Doggerland because of activity of animals other than humans or processes of other natural processes which haven't been considered. Next. And it was when I, I put that photograph in the middle of, of Graham Clark's map that I thought, oh, yeah, actually, we could probably find more material that can be compared uh, with what results we're getting from, from coring or from other types of survey in, in order to broaden the scope of, of our understanding and of what conditions might have been like. Next, please. When I started looking into the conditions of, this is back in the mid 1990s, looking at what Doggerland might have been like, the speculation. Uh, my, what I call primitive presentation technology was very primitive indeed. 
um, handwritten notes. Next, please. And for the first seminar I gave on the subject, overheads. And I dare say a good many of you have uh, not used overheads during your academic life um, or, or whatever, uh, because they didn't last very long as the main means of, of presentation. I hope you recognize that, Matt. Uh, I used it in, in that first seminar. Nobody knew where it was, uh, but it's actually, it's actually just the map upside down of normal map of Doggerland. And it was, I, I did that because I, I didn't want people to have preconceptions of, of where they were in the world. But continuing the, the speculation, next please. I did come to something that was publishable. I, well, it turned out to be publishable and my thanks to the Prehistoric Society for, for publishing. Um, the funding for the research which I'd done came through a British Academy grant and the funding of the maps, the publication of the maps came from a a small grant from the University of Exeter Research Fund and to enable publication of coloured maps, which wasn't all that common only 25 years ago or whatever it is. And yet that I think was one of the main, it was something of significance that it could be done in colour. It had much greater impact and it also I think shows that mapping is of great importance for attracting and helping a wider audience to get them interested in the area. And that's something again, which has come very, through very much, very strongly in, in the papers on both days, um, that providing the map will help people to see what it is that you're getting at um, and to remember what it's like. And it's good to see that there's been so much put in to that aspect of the research. Next, please. Right. Coming back to Clement Reed, I think if you, if you can read this, um, I'll just read it out. Knowledge cannot be divided into compartments each given a definite name and allotted for a different, to a different student. There are and always must be branches of knowledge in which several sciences meet or have an interest. And these are somewhat liable to be neglected. Well, that was 1913. They haven't been uh, neglected in recent years, judging by what we've been hearing, that the branches of knowledge have come together and have produced um, really an amazing range of results. Next, please. And I, I think the presentations that we've heard have, have shown the diversity of organizations, not just branches of knowledge, but of the institutions behind them, um, which have appeared, and, and I think Nick Fleming commented on this as well. The universities that are involved, new as well as old, in fact, perhaps rather more new than old, um, state institutions, museums, individuals, various community trusts and groups, um, and co co collaboration between them. And it's also been made very clear today that, that the research has spread well beyond the, beyond the area of Doggerland to coastal regions throughout the world. And, and results have come through that will have a major impact on our understanding of the past. And also, as again, we've heard from some of the later papers today, particularly um, significant implications for the future and for our understanding of, of the processes of 
change that will come about with climate change as well. Next, please. The, the poem that I quoted at the beginning um, was unexpected to see, but there has actually been quite a lot of interest from, from non-archaeologists in Doggerland, uh, from writers of fiction, travel, uh, the poetry, uh, newspaper articles, quite a lot, and not just reporting on the research, um, documentaries as well. Next, please. And uh, a small, a very small sample here of, of, of the, those publications which acknowledge Doggerland as a place that once existed in all in their own very different ways from children's books and uh, crime fiction uh, to the uh, work of, of writers like Julia Blackbird, uh, Blackburn, putting together uh, uh, an interpretation or a uh, view of an area that's becoming of, of greater interest. And again, perhaps this shows the importance of naming. Um, I noticed in the course of, of the papers that uh, various research grants for, for, which have enabled the bigger teams to do things and the development of the technologies have really quite good catchy titles. And it's, it's probably one of the one of the factors that win grants. Get a good title and you're on the way to getting it. Next, please. Right. Um, I won't go on for too long. I know we're already past the 5.30. So I just want to say thank you to, to Vince Gaffney. And next, please. And to Jeff. Jeff Bailey, uh, next. And thanks, thanks certainly for me to both of you for putting up, putting things together. It's probably taken quite a lot of planning and lots of ad adaptations because of the pandemic, uh, but many thanks and I'm sure from, from all the other speakers as well uh, for doing it and for staying with it and actually getting getting us to have these two days of, of excellent papers from a whole range of people. Um, and I hope that something similar might happen another 20 years time, something like that. <laughs> no, maybe rather sooner if we get the results. So I'll stop there and say thanks all round. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Bryony. That was a, a really good way of rounding things off. I like the idea of a, getting a good title and a good picture as well. Uh, there look to be some questions, would you, or comments? Um, I'll just see what we've got here. Um, I know time is getting on. Uh, let me see. Some of these... Uh, refer to earlier comments. Anthony Firth, thank you, Bryony. I remember you giving a paper at the Geolsoc in the late 90s where and then it stopped. We'll carry <laughs> on. <laughs> mm. I remember giving you giving a paper at the Jolsock in the late 90s where someone from the audience said your slides were upside down, entirely missing the point. Really <laughs> enjoyed this. Many thanks. 